Okay, guys. So, um, welcome. Um, I'm just going to start going ahead, uh, and hopefully, if people are late, they can still join. They should still be able to join us. Um, and um, there will be a recording of this um, later on. Um, so, um, yeah, welcome. So, um, I'm Rory. I'm one of the instructors at Blair Baddock. Uh, I mostly uh, work in Pinkston. Um, uh, doing the doing stuff out of there as well as we were just starting to run um, a training course for teachers and outdoor learning in the city when we all got locked inside. And um, so the basis of this course was it was originally it was a SAPO, um, which is the um, Scottish Advisory Panel for Outdoor Education. So they had designed a course called Taking Learning Outdoors. That was a, a six hour course that was usually done over a day or four evening sessions. Uh, and it's about introductory to outdoor learning um, for educational staff and how they how they might approach it. So basically, what we've done is taken bits and pieces of that course and basically put in as many practicalities around um, COVID nineteen as we can. Okay. I should also introduce sorry uh, Andy T, who is somewhere. Um, he will also be giving some part of the presentation. Um, he's in here somewhere. Um, so you can probably see Callum, but I'm not sure Randy D has disappeared off them. Um, <laughs> there will be uh, recordings. Um, so I'm recording this now. Um, and we will be sharing the recordings uh, through social media and stuff like that. Um, we'll also be sharing, I'll, sh I'll probably, I'll have to figure out how to share you a copy of the slides. We'll probably do that um, via email. Um, I'll get Neil to send it out to you because I don't have your emails. And we will be stopping, um, there's breaks in the slides um, so you guys can ask questions. But if you have any questions in the meantime where we're presenting things, um, just jump on, uh, just type them in the chat and then we'll um, try and get back to them when we get through the questions. Um, I'll do my best to not look at the chat while I'm presenting because I can get all distracted while uh, if I keep reading it. Um, so, uh, the things we're aiming to go through is basically a sort of an introduction to outdoor learning. Um, the reason I, why I understand um, you guys are getting involved in this is that it might be something that you're asked about in your hubs on um, just advice from schools and stuff like that. Um, so, it's so you guys can get a little bit of background uh, about what we're presenting um, about outdoor learning, um, and also why it's why it's such a big push and why it's sort of a, it's new, multiple news articles that are every couple of days about uh, how to, our outdoor learning is going to be the solution, or um, how outdoor learning is going to be the solution for returning to school in August. Okay, and um, so we're going to go through some benefits of outdoor learning. Um, some guidelines uh, on how outdoor learning could be managed within the schools and introduced within the schools. So this is from sort of a mix of reading the guidance, but also um, myself and a couple of the other staff at Blair Vatic have been active in doing outdoor learning sessions with that in the hubs. Um, so we also are going to look at a couple of ideas about how we might plan what equipment we might need or how we might want to set up the schools um, for outdoor learning as we're going on and um, as well as and um, we're going to look at how the the paperwork of uh, outdoor learning and um, so what paperwork you require to go out of school and we're also going to be introducing quite a lot of resources that should be available come um, August um, for outdoor learning um, as well as some more support and news from Blair Baddock. Um, so, what is outdoor learning? Okay, so outdoor learning is an approach to learning which can be incorporated and at appropriate times in every area of the curriculum. Okay, um, in other words, it's not um, a subject. So, outdoor learning is not a subject, it's not the adventurous activities that. Um, we at Blair Valley specialize in. It's not going out and learning about trees and plants and stuff like that. That can be part of it. Um, but what it's really about is that it's another environment where teaching can place, take place. Okay. Um, it's a, an extension to your learning environment. And um, it's where you can have 
multiple different you can be following doing curriculum for excellence planning and um, but rather than just rather than taking a class and doing your class inside in the classroom as normal and um, it's just staying uh, it's, it's just choosing the plan to plan it plan to do your learning outside so your math your numeracy whatever okay so we're just going to go through a couple of examples of how that could be okay so it could be to enforce or re-enhance the learning okay wait and Callum to change the slide <laughs> There we go. Uh, it could be to reinforce or to enhance or reinforce the learning. Um, so within um, so within this, these photos, what was this class was doing? Their uh, learning attention was they were learning to sort and match a variety of categories. So they had done a bit of sorting and matching and stuff like that inside. So to make that learning occurs, all they did was they took it out to a different environment. They took it outside. They started using different materials. And basically, they were doing the same thing as they were doing in the classroom, but just in a different environment to reinforce the learning that they were doing. So they were doing something in the classroom, then we're doing it outside. Simple as that. Okay. Now, it can be also used as a, a stimulus for learning. Um, so uh, in this instance, this class, what they were doing was uh, they were using traditional tales as their context for learning. So the teacher wanted to use the woodland area near their school and um, to inspire the children uh, as part of a creating creative writing exercise and um, so what the teacher did was and um, she hid a number of objects around the school these were like small little parcels with the tin foil stuff like that um, and what she did was she then took the pupils into the uh, woodland area um, and they um, the teachers and other staff members who were the teachers, they recorded what the pupils were saying as they found each of the objects. So just recording what the, and use these, they use questions. So, oh, what do you think this bit is? What do you think that could have been in the story? Okay. Um, and they recorded all these um, questions and answers from, from the pupils. They took this back into the classroom. They reread this to the pupils, and then this inspired them to sort of come together and make a bigger story. Okay, so that's uh, what this section was. It can be also used uh, to deliver specific E's and O's. So I'm not going to read out the E's and O's the o there listed, but basically this, cl uh, this class were they're looking at um, recording data uh, and displaying it. So what they did was they chose to do a traffic survey, um, they recorded their information outside, and then they took it back inside uh, and we're making bar charts and pie, cl and pie classes. So this is still outdoor learning, going outside, just recording something, going back inside. That's still the sort of stuff we're talking about, okay? Um, next, uh, it also allows the pupils to have influence on what they're doing, okay? So for instance, in this example, a class was visiting um, a school, or sorry, a church um, coffee morning. Um, and the, the people started talking to the elderly folk um, who were at the, the coffee morning. And they basically, the elderly folk were commenting on how the, um, the old kirkyard was in a bit of a state and it really needed maintained and stuff like that. And the pupils um, decided, uh, well, the pupils decided they would be interested in um, restoring it. And to restore it, they um, actually went through an award called the John Muir Award. Okay, and basically, the John Muir Award is a, a conservation-based award and um, about discovering, uh, exploring, and conserving outdoor spaces and sharing their experiences of that. Okay, so um, and basically that led to a John Muir Award for a John Muir Discovery Award, which is the lowest level, um, for those pupils, um, and they were. Those people's and parents actually help who are helpers. Okay, um, the John Muir Award is aimed at sort of um, high high primary six and sevens, and um, but there are other outdoor learning awards. Um, sort of the other big one for younger ages would be run by the RSPB, so they are running a, an outdoor um, sort of uh, outdoor um, learning awards, which are quite good. Uh, as in, if you're looking for a sort of well, a piece of paper at the end of it, basically. And um, uh, John, uh, for Blair Vatic run John Muir awards based around the canal and exploring the canal and 
conserving the canal for wildlife up at Danton Pinkston. So that's what I spend most of my time doing. Um, it can also be used to bundle um, E's and O's into challenges. Um, so, for instance, in this example, this, this school, they were building raised beds in the back of their school. Uh, and what happened uh, is that the, they got a delivery of soil. Um, obviously, if you've never got soil delivered, you don't realize that they just dump it at the front of your building and they don't bring it anywhere useful to you. So that challenge was for them was to figure out how they could get that soil all the way around the building, how long it would take, how much weight of soil it was. So all these things um, that from one challenge, they managed to cover loads of these E's and O's um, and, and take off loads of things that they could have done. Okay. There is going to be lots of um, challenges as we are going back to schools. And um, so as in lots of these challenges that are going to come to us is ways is are things that we can um, use as learning experiences for both us and for the pupils. Um, assessment two. So one of the important things that is sometimes missed in a lot of outdoor learning is people think of going outside, they do an activity, but it's not considered about how that activity is being recorded as part of the learning process. How is that activity being assessed? Okay. And um, so for instance, the pupils had been doing measuring at, um, in the classroom and they took those skills and um, they were, this is again in the kirkyard, they were ended measuring the, um, measuring the gravestones and then they were then making the 3D models after okay so they returned to class made 3d models and basically that was their assessment method so they were they were they were learning a skill practicing it and then they were demonstrating they had uh, they, they had use of it basically and um, through the whole process of going inside outside inside outside okay and um, there's different ways uh, the people can be uh, used to assess things outside and um, four books is one that pupils can be recording um, in a big, large book on the ground, recording what they've done outside. And um, digital uh, methods such as videos and photographs is a great way of recording what pupils are up to. Early years are really good at this. It's it's part of their uh, it, uh, it. Early years tend to track things a lot more in depth. Uh, and, and I'm trying to avoid that boy treating the chat, but I'm looking at someone commenting on my body language. Um, the um, early years of using digital methods of recording videos because they, they, they're, they're required to, they update their parents uh, on a daily basis on what is done. So using videos and recordings of that is a really great way of capturing things outside and capturing what people are doing. Um, we can also be doing pre pre <laughs> pre uh, diagrams and post diagrams. Um, so that could be mind maps or just pictures and diagrams. Or um, clickers, if you haven't heard of it, is a type of um, they're like QR codes, and you, if you turn them up different directions, and um, they basically uh, give multiple choice. Um, so basically, you can ask a whole group, a whole class, a question. They turn their clicker card whichever way they want. You scan it with your phone, and it'll basically tell. It'll basically then tell you which um, which answer they gave. So it's a really good way of tracking what individuals thought was the answer, rather than just the whole class. So you can get an idea of what um, if someone wasn't getting it, you might see that oh they're not, not they're not getting that because I can see it and see it on the app that the, they were constantly getting the questions wrong. So it might be something then you could approach later on. And um, you can also use uh, assessment sheets, which are basically just sheets that you can use to tick things off outside. So that'll be the teacher going outside and then recording and ticking off uh, the people did this outside and stuff like that. Um, right. And now, any questions that aren't relating to? Uh, oh no, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Um, so, what are the reasons why we, why we might want to go outside? Okay, first is um, mess. We can make a mess outside, okay? And it's great. We don't have to worry about if we're doing activities that are involving using natural materials, like using, like in the previous example, they were using counters and, and stuff like that, using uh, natural stones and rocks and stuff like that. If we're using those, we don't really need to worry about putting them back in place and stuff like that. We can make a bit of a mess outside. 
Um, if we are bringing stuff into the outside, um, we can make sure we're using biodegradable materials. So if we're using like um, cotton, wool, or string to do any projects or anything like that outside, we can try and clean, we can, we'll aim to clean it up as best we can, but if there's any biodegradable materials left outside, it won't, it won't matter too much. We don't have to worry about it um, uh, because it'll decay over time. Um, there's an element of risk, um, which is a good thing. Okay, I'm not going to get too to in far into the de into the um, benefits of risk. Um, I know this audience will uh, all appreciate that the risk is a, a, is a good thing for children. Um, but basically, the outdoor environment is an environment that risk is beneficial, and it gives opportunity for kids to learn how to judge things. Um, we're not saying that we we're forcing the kids to take risks, and many of the many outdoor most almost all outdoor learnings will be of minimal risk. But um, they will be a, a more complicated environment than your standard classroom would be. Um, space outdoors um, gives lots of space. Now that's really important in the current times, and that's one of the big drivers for why we're looking at um, why we're looking at um, outdoor learning now is that it's giving us that volume of space where we have both space for physical distancing, and, but also risk of transmission is lower because um, we have more volumes of air passing through. So we're, we're less likely to be, and we're less likely to be touching the same things and stuff like that. So space is a really good reason. Um, and it's the main reason why we're going for it now. Um, noise, we can make, kids can make as much noise as they want. <laughs> Uh, when they're outside uh, and we can get away from them a little bit more. Um, so which is one of the great advantages. Um, so anything like art, drama, anything where the kids are yelling and screeching and um, that you would never want to do in a classroom, the outdoors is great for that because we can have, you know, you can just let them um, be a little bit more verbal, have debates outside and um, all these things that you usually would have tried to avoid in the classroom. Artifacts. So basically artifacts, there's lots of stuff in the outdoors. There's lots of trees, branches, leaves, bugs, all these things which are just there and they're free for us to use. And they are stuff that the kids will be interested in engage, uh, engaging in. So lots of stuff that we can use doesn't cost anything, um, but can, it can be a great resource for doing loads of, of different activities and loads of different learning. There is a very long um, policy background on outdoor learning, um, but basically um, current um, Scottish government policy, um, even pre-COVID-19, is that outdoor learning is, is something that all children, uh, all pupils, should have an opportunity to get involved in. Um, so it's basically the, the, the current, uh, and this is in the teaching standards as well, um, all teachers should be um, it's doing some level of outdoor learning. Um, it doesn't have to be much, but it is part of the teaching standards. Um, it's in um, uh, how good is your school. Um, it is it is also good in, in how good is your outdoor uh, how good is your early, early years. Um, so it is mentioned in, in all the in all these documents as being key. Um, uh, as in, well, it is being is in is important that an opportunity it should be an opportunity that everyone um, all peoples get. Um, now questions so far. I believe there's some questions. Uh, of, well, they're mainly about not being able to hear me. Um, so, unfortunately, I'm quite WebEx, so I'm not. I, I, as far as I'm aware, I'm not I'm muted, so I cannot. I have no idea how to feedback on that. Oh, is that someone randomly talking there, or? Maureen, we can all hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> there's no questions to be about that. We'll move on to the next section. Which MDT should be delivering? So, can we find MDT? Yep. Uh, can you hear me, Rory? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, folks. Um, my name's, uh, I'm going to 
leave my camera off if that's okay. I had problems presenting last time um, and it might be a bandwidth issue at my end. I live out in the countryside a bit. So, um, but I, if everyone can hear me, I'm going to talk to you um, and I'll maybe wave to you later once I'm not talking anymore. So thank you very much, Rory, for your section. Uh, my name's Andy T. Uh, I'm one of the uh, full-time instructors at Blair Varrick, if any of you have been there. Uh, we may have met previously. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some effective group management strategies for outdoor learning. Um, and for, uh, for your convenience, we've divided those into C's and B's. Uh, it says six C's and four B's. There's actually going to be seven C's um, as we go through them. Um, don't worry if you haven't had time to scribble those down yet. Um, there's going to be a slide on each individual C and B. So I'm ready for the next slide. Thanks, Callum. OK, so the first C we're going to talk about is um, consent. Um, uh, consent will be required for any outdoor learning activities uh, that you're going to do off of the school property. So um, you may be um, choosing to go to a local park right next door to the school. Um, but if that's the case and you're leaving, leaving the school property, um, you will need parental consent. Now, consent can be gained in one go for something that you might con uh, that you're going to say is routine and expected. So it could be done at the start of the year um, for a regular sort of once a week trip out to the local park um, to do some out outdoor learning. So that would perhaps make it slightly easier um, if you were wanting to do something like that that you could get um, consent all in one go. Um, but also, if you're going to do stuff even in the school grounds, um, it's good practice, best practice to inform the parents uh, that that's going to take place. It's also quite important to get um, parents on board with that. Some parents are, are quite unduly anxious about outdoor learning um, and they might think um, you're going to do very adventurous things that they don't want their young people to do. Um, so it's really important to do your PR and um, get the parents on board with what the plan is, what you intend to do, um, explain it to them. Um, in some parents as well might see outdoor learning as, um, as a, just really a bit of messing around and not really doing any proper education. So again, you need to address that and um, explain um, what it is that you intend to do and um, why it's valuable. I'm ready for the next slide, Callum. Thank you. So the next slide is um, chemist, which um, it's basically making sure that the young people have all the medications um, that they're going to need with them. This is something that we find at times quite complicated at Blair Vadek. Um, just it, the, the one that's always the problem is the asthma inhaler. Um, if the parents have put down on the medical form that their child has asthma, they need to have their inhaler with them. And that's part of Glasgow City Council's policies. So again, making parents aware of that in advance because um, you don't want to have a young person having to sit out of some outdoor learning because they haven't got their inhaler with them. And it's also really important that the young person has it accessible with them so they don't they don't just leave it at, at school or inside the school if they're out on the playground doing the outdoor learning. Um, put it in their pocket and um, bring it out with them um, so that they have access to it if they need it. Um, medical, sorry, Callum, just stay on the slide we were on. I hadn't quite finished. So back to the chemist. Thank you. Um, another thing that you'll need to do is to chat to the school and make sure all the medical information that the school has recorded is up to date. Um, we're about to go into the summer holidays, so probably when we come back um, and young people have been away from school for quite a, a period at the moment, uh, definitely want to have a conversation with the school in advance and make sure that they have got up to date medical information for all of the young people um, that they're going to uh, keep on record. The paperwork for this needs to be safe uh, in an agreed location, GDPR compliant, et cetera, et cetera uh, but accessible. So you would need to be able to, to see that and look at that information before you did the outdoor um, learning session. You're also going to need to have thought in advance and got yourself together an, an appropriate first aid kit. It might be that uh, this is something you guys do already and you're ahead of the curve. Um, also, that schools might well have one that's suitable but you certainly need to think about that in advance um, and make sure that you've got um, all the things you would need for your, your typical first aid situations that you're going to maybe need to deal with. Okay Callum, thank you. So the third um, C to think about is communication. So um, 
the most important one here is your own personal communication that you're going to use um, should you have some kind of difficulty. So mobile phone, the classic is we all get caught out with is um, our mobile phone having almost run out of charge. Um, so making sure you've addressed that before you go to your outdoor um, learning session and maybe even you have a charger with you so you can, if you really need to, give it a quick 10 minute boost before you go outside. Um, one thing that we find quite useful, we recommend at Blair Vadak is some kind of emergency contact card. Um, so what is your process you're going to go through if you do need help and assistance? Um, your contact within the school, have that written down, who it is and their phone number. Have a second and third option if you can't get through to the first person. Um, perhaps your own internal uh, system of, of who your point of contact is going to be. Um, if you're having um, having a bad day and you need some extra assistance. Um, within the school, certainly, you're going to want the name of a teacher that's going to back you up. Um, they may be You may be doing the outdoor learning session yourself, but you'll need access. Say you're having a behavior issue, something like that, and you need an extra pair of hands. Um, you can't be going into the school yourself and leaving the young people. So you'll need a way of, you need to know which number to call to, to get someone to come and help you. And then also you'll need to be able to address the communication with the young people um, whilst you're running your outdoor learning session. Um, some kind of method for getting young people back when you want them. So quite a good thing here is a loud refer referee's whistle. Um, you blow the whistle and the young people come, and come running back to, to an agreed location. Could be a gong, a bell, um, anything appropriate. Um, at Blair Vadak, sometimes when we do orienteering and the young people are a little bit further away from us, we want to make sure we can make a loud enough noise. We've got one of those air horns that you pump up with a bicycle pump. It makes quite a loud noise. Everyone comes back. Um, we don't advocate giving whistles to each young person individually. Um, some people might think that's a good idea for them to attract your attention. What we found, uh, if you do try that, is that the young people just blow their blow their whistles to mess you about, and and because it's good fun to see what happens. Um, but you have a loud whistle, so you can call the young people back um, when you need them. Uh, next slide, thank you, Callum. Right, clothing. Um, this is always going to be a challenge. Uh, this will need to be part of your um, your consent stage, talking to the parents, PR stage. Uh, making sure the young people uh, the young people come to your outdoor learning session with the appropriate clothing and and equipment that they need. So um, layered of layered clothing, sports clothing um, is great. Um, they're going to want some kind of waterproof layers to go with that. So uh, top and bottoms, if possible, um, we would recommend the sort of single layer of actual plasticky waterproof type jackets and trousers um, so we know that they are actually waterproof rather than a big a big nice um, jacket that that may or may not actually be waterproof um, the other advantage with that it's actually pretty easy to clean so if you are doing things where the young people are going to get themselves um, a little bit grubby a quick soapy sponge is enough to to get the the mud off the outside of, of those kind of waterproofs Depending on the time of year, you're probably going to want them to bring hats and gloves as well. Um, and suitable footwear that may be in addition to the footwear uh, that they're going to be wearing in school. So maybe wellies or just another pair of appropriate outdoor shoes. And um, wellies can be great. Um, just bear in mind in the winter, uh, they actually can feel quite cold. So they'll need warm socks inside the wellies um, to keep them warm whilst they're taking part in the outdoor learning session. Now we have talked to the schools about this, um, that maybe some form of clothing rail could be useful. Uh, one issue that, that will need to be addressed within the school um, with the COVID limitations is that the colloquiums are going to be quite confined. So getting ready for an outdoor learning session, getting them dressed up. Um, uh, they might not be able to access the normal cloakrooms just because of how confined they are. So it might be that they're, they're getting dressed up, getting their extra layers on in the classroom um, because they'll already be laid out um, ready um, to take allowance for the COVID restrictions. So with that in mind, if uh, each young person has some kind of backpack that they can keep their extra kit in, that's probably the best way of approaching that. So they come with a bag with all their extra bits in and then they, when they need to put their layers on, they can do that um, and they don't necessarily need to go to the closer cloak room and hang their stuff up there. Uh, next slide, please, Cal. 
Uh, the fifth C we're standing, so saying stands for cuisine, so they're going to need food and drink with them. Um, water bottle uh, would be the ideal thing to have, um, so they can top it up if they need to. Um, if it's just a short outdoor learning session, so you're not going out for the whole day, they might not need a packed lunch, but uh, they should probably bring snacks with them. Um, as many of you know, I'm sure, when young people start to get a bit low on, 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 their, on energy, um, that's sometimes when you get a bit of lack of motivation or a, or, or a bit of a dip in behavior. So definitely bringing snacks with them, two or three things, maybe a bit of fruit and a couple of chocolate biscuits or something, um, and having those in their pack that they're going to bring with them um, will be ideal just to keep them going um, for your session. And if you don't need them, you don't need them, but better to have them than, than not need them. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. <clears throat> and uh, the sixty we're saying is is count. You're gonna uh, whilst you're you're running your outdoor learning session, you're gonna want be wanting to be counting heads. Uh, if you've ever seen the Blairvadic outdoor instructors out and about, um, we do that a lot. Uh, just constantly keeping tabs on where everyone is, and we've we've got everyone with us that we should have. Um, one of the perhaps practical ways of addressing this, um, if you've got uh, a little area you're working from, is to have uh, assigned seating so each young person is returning to the same spot uh, when they come back to you um, and you can very quickly see straight away when somebody's missing and as you get to know them you'll recognize who it, who it is and um, so you can easily keep tabs on people that way. But head counting, constantly monitoring how many people you've got with you. Um, next slide please Carl. And the bonus C we're saying um, it, at the moment with the, especially in our current climate, is going to be cleanliness. Um, so hand washing is going to become part of the normal routine. Um, we have got a link here to some options of, of practical ways for addressing that. I'm not suggesting that you look at that now. That's something for later. Um, but um, from what I understand, all the schools are supposed to be getting um, an outdoor hand washing station um, installed. I, I don't know what the time frame is for that yet, but um, definitely um, hand washing built into your session before and after and appropriate times um, is going to be an important consideration. Obviously, if you haven't got access to actual running water, then it's going to be your hand gels, wet wipes, etc. Um, plan for that in advance and have those with you. Um, thank you. Next slide, Carl. So, um, on to the Bs. So, first B we're saying stands for base. So, um, bringing the young people to the area where you're going to do your outdoor learning and establishing where your group space is. So, this is where they're going to come back to. Might be that you're spending the whole time there, um, just moving around in that one little area. But if you're doing something like orienteering, they might be moving a little bit wider away from you and then coming back to you. But clearly establishing where the base, is, the base is, pick something prominent, an area of outdoor seating or a particular big prominent tree, something like that, and make sure everybody knows where the base is. It could be useful at this stage to have a wee trial run with your whistle, to get everyone to, to move away for 30 seconds and, and call it back again, just so they get used to the idea of, of how you're going to operate. Uh, next slide please, Callum. Um, next is on the boundaries, so making sure Everybody knows um, where you're working and what your area is. Um, it might be that as we go back um, after the summer, that more than one group at the same time is using the school playground, for example. Um, we're still trying to maintain physical distancing between different groups of young people. Um, so you might need your, your own little area that you're working in, in cordoned off. Um, many ways of doing this, I'm sure you could, you could think for yourselves, but um, roping off the area, doesn't necessarily have to be a great big rope, could be string, um, traffic cone type things, um, space makers that you might use for sport and PE anyway, um, difficult, different uh, physical boundaries. Um, if you're out in the park, it could be different areas. Uh, we're using the grass, they're using the tarmac over there. Um, you can put up sticks with little bits of wool tied to them or little flags on the top. Um, Wool is quite useful if you are going to be um, out and about from from the school area, just in case you miss any on the tidy up, because wool is actually biodegradable. Um, and yeah, make sure you've established how you're going to keep your group separate from other groups or, or 
members of the public, etc. And the next B, please, Carl. Thank you. The next B is buddies, uh, useful tried and tested technique for um, managing young people uh, when they were away from the school, but even if you're operating in the playground, just to help keep tabs on people, um, having young people work in buddies. And it might be if you're working with younger children um, that what they'll be doing in the school is putting them into little social groups um, as they might be finding it quite difficult to maintain um, the physical distancing. They're going to be working in little groups of four or five and they're going to be maintaining those groups through all the activities that they do. So those might already be established. So rather than just your traditional pair of buddies, it, it might be a small little group of young people um, who are going to be working together. Uh, thank you, Callum. Next, B. And then B for behavior. Um, a good idea to have worked out a behavior plan um, before you go for an outdoor learning session. So um, as we know, when we're doing our outdoor learning, it's, it's often exciting and engaging and um, behavior issues often become a lot less. Um, but if you've thought in advance what you're going to do, it makes it much easier to address uh, situations should they arrive. It might be that the school has that you're working with has a behavior plan anyway, and you should just talk to the teachers in advance, find out what their plan is and, and just fall in line with that. But as an example, you might need a little timeout area um, where you're going to ask a, a young person just to, to spend a couple of minutes to cool off. Um, or um, what you're going to do if something more serious happens, this might be where you need your contact card and you're going to call um, a member of staff to come and assist you to help you deal with a, a particular behaviour issue. It might be you'll need to check this in advance that particular young people in particular schools have an individual risk assessment, um, not necessarily to do with behaviour, um, could be to do with additional need of some sort. Um, but it also could be a situation that we often discuss at Blair Vadek is a young person who might be considered a flight risk. So if you're going to be doing an, an outdoor learning session, you need to know who that young person is and what you're going to do about it. And maybe even whether it's appropriate that, that they're able to take part in that particular activity. You'll need to think that through in advance um, and discuss it with the teachers concerned. Um, another important thing to be aware when you're doing your outdoor learning, there's all kinds of distractions in the outdoors. Um, and these are actually pot potentially really useful learning opportunities. So rather than, than getting um, sort of worked up with yourself and that, that your session doesn't appear to be going exactly according to plan, um, sometimes it's easier to just go with it. And um, if, for example, classic one might be that you see a bee a bee flies by, causes pandemonium in your session for a few seconds. Um, let that car calm down a bit and then maybe have a chat about, well, why are we scared of bees? Actually, are they really that much of a risk? What, why, are, why are bees important? That's a particularly um, topical issue at the moment. Um, we actually have a shortage of bees um, in the country and bees are really important for pollination, for our food. Um, Lots of interesting things can come out of a distraction, discussions you can have with young person. So um, run with it and um, um, don't get too worried if your session goes slightly differently to how you uh, planned and envisaged that it would. So thank you very much. That's um, my wee section finished there. Uh, if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, feel free to turn off your microphone and ask me. Or if you prefer, stick it in the chat and we'll do our best to answer it. Thank you. The one great recommendation I saw here on a, another po on post from another place was about uh, children like enforcing rules. Uh, so especially uh, as in if, if you're introducing the, the social distancing, if you if you make a couple of the children the uh, the the the, uh, the referees of social distancing, they will make sure that it's happening without you having to do much work. <laughs> Good tip, Rory. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. So, and someone's saying about um, people, uh, sc schools not living, bringing, allowing people to fill up bottles, and, and there's going to be lots of issues. Individual schools making individual issues. Uh, um, obviously, everything we're saying is only sort of advice and tips, and we're not by any means experts on how, as in 
as, as you know, Glasgow will Glasgow schools will never all do the same thing. Um, so, as in, we we're giving advice, uh, and but hopefully we can uh, uh, hopefully um, everything is happening reasonably in schools, and hopefully we can give good advice. And if there is issues like water bottles and stuff like that, we can um, hopefully preempt things that like that. Or, um, hopefully preempt issues that might might crop up and we could give advice to the schools about things that might be happening like that and how it might cause issues and that might not be fully thought through and um, so if there's no direct questions we'll move on to the next section which is how we might make the most of the school grounds okay so how the grounds might be set up for outdoor learning and and and, and how we might manage the resources within those school grounds um, so what we've done is we've taken an example school, um, which is Blair Dowry Primary. Um, so this is a primary that I, this is one of the hubs that I, I personally have been working um, at uh, over the, I can. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the uh, hubs I've been working at over the, of the current period. And I've been going in and doing outdoor learning classes. It was more uh, we have we did some of these setups but obviously we were while working in the hubs this school maxed out about i think about 20 pupils so we didn't have to worry about dividing the playgrounds up into different areas for different classes and stuff like that too much um but we did, were using some outdoor classroom setup and um, so things that might need to be considered um going forward with the schools is that a lot of schools will be planning for things like staggered lunch breaks and stuff like that, so that classes aren't sharing the same outdoor space, but also that different classes are using different areas of the yard. Um, so some idea we had about that is about basically that you could be dividing, or well, probably want to be dividing your um, outdoor, your school grounds into different spaces for different classes, but also as a, an overall break space, okay? Um, so that you could have classes, two, three, four classes, depending on the, um, the sizes of the, the individual school grounds. You could have those spaces set up for outdoor learning sessions, and then you could still have a break space that other the rest of the pupils or whatever pupils time, turn it was for break that they could be going out and, and having their break. Um, so um, some different setups we had was, um, so this is one of our, our, our I'll go, this is one of our orienteering maps. Um, but so some different setups we had was basically we would have had different exits and entrances into the building. Um, so the star shapes are just hand wash stations, having marked out lines, as, as you should be well, well familiar by now, having marked out lines going up to those wash stations so that people are going in and out, they can wash their hands, et cetera, with plenty of space and not be causing too much trouble. Um, probably these entrance and exit spaces are probably going to be the most complicated spaces within the school setup and um, so that the, they need to be matching is you know, a lot of schools will be doing one-way systems and stuff like that so any um, any any way of going out of the building or into the building needs to be matched to the um the plan that that the plan that's happening inside the building and um, in this, you might have noticed loads of uh, circles. So those are all social distancing circles. So we just circles that we can mark on the ground that the pupils could be making, um, having their own workspace. And in this instance, again, we also have the, you might have noticed the orange markers could have been, as Andy was saying, about just ropes or phones or something along those lines, just so that, they, that any, if people are going off and doing a little bit of work, they know that that's, that's, that, that's their area. Um, if a school, I'll, I'll just say it now before I forget, if a school has an area as a relatively interesting playground like this one where they've got a mix of grass and stuff like that, it's also really important that each area has a mix of environments, okay? I know that's not always possible in all playgrounds, but that basically, that, uh, that uh, we can... I'm not sure who's some. I couldn't I can feedback from someone there. Christina, you're on mute. Christina, <laughs> Christina, you're not on mute. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Uh, sort of that interruption. Um, and in this area, we also had a, an area marked down the ground. So these are just semicircles. So basically, it'd be a, a layout where people could sit on the ground and they'd be feel focused in on some a teacher or a staff member presenting something. And um, so everyone's focused in on one point. 
And we also ha had another type of setup, basically a more circular setup. So we have a nice little setup in the corner that all the pupils are facing into one another. So obviously that leads to much more um, discussion base where the pupils are all looking to center, talking with one another, much more interactive towards um, one another. So uh, what might these actually look like in real life? Because we do have photos of what these look like in real life. And um, so. And um, oh, just mentioning as well, uh, obviously, this is just the map of the school grounds. Um, this school, like a lot of schools, also have a full playing field. And a lot of those playing fields could be used as those spaces for outdoor learning. They could be used as those break spaces. But obviously, there's going to be issues to do with footwear and, and damp and stuff like that. And uh, how the space is being used other times and stuff like that. But it is going to be probably a space that a lot of schools will 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 start with needing and using for much more purposes than just as this as the sports pitch and stuff like that and um, so the first setup you saw there was lots of circles and um, so this is a sort of a basic example of what, what that might look like so this actually started more as a sort of learning about distancing so the these uh, young people they were just practicing drawing two meter circles around themselves and um, but what this also did was it created um, a workspace for them to be doing stuff in their circles uh, and uh, th those of you who are maths inclined would realize that you would normally need to actually do one meter circles and if the one meter circles weren't touching or sorry if they were in the middle of the one meter circles then they'd be two meters apart but having two meter circles basically just allowed them to figure out that distancing, but it also allowed a teacher or staff member to go into amongst them and without having to break their um, their, their meet, take their spaces. A uh, teacher or could check up on what they were doing in their individual spaces without having to get too close um, uh, and break in between them. Um, another setup we were using was basically, as you saw, the sort of the semicircles. Uh, and basically, this was uh, a great setup for and um, just briefing and telling telling people what to do and stuff like that. It's not something they'd be staying in for a long time, but you know, it's something where you're presenting something outdoors, explaining something outdoors. And um, a pretty quick setup. And um, it was so that was just done in chalk with a with a tape measure. Pretty quick setup for what you can do uh, and just making sure they're um, spacing themselves out and um, and not uh, and being nice and distant uh, and they know where they're going as well. And um, we did pass around equipment in this in this in group, um, but actually what we were using to pass around equipment was there wasn't enough space in this setup for a, a staff member to go in between them. So they were actually passing buckets of stuff between them with their feet. So that way, basically, they were minimizing that that contact of um, and, and transmission risks. Um, we also had a, a setup of a, this was socially distant seating. So this was in the, in the in up in the sort of grassy area, and basically we're just using the crates as set seating that they were far enough away from one another that the pupils were um, being physically distant. Uh, but also we had a number another of other advantages. We could see some hula hoops. These were spaces that the pupils could move in closer. This was a fire, for instance, um, but they they could move into the fire and do something at the fire, but then move back. There was also a gap um, in the circle, so that allowed to do stuff like if we we're handing out equipment, we could put the put the equipment in the gap, and then the pupils could circle the whole way around the circle um, and pick stuff up or drop stuff off. I'll talk a little bit more about equipment management in a second, um, but basically that the, there was space to pass things out or take things back in without anyone actually getting too close to one another. Um, Staying outside, uh, comfort uh, is going to be an important thing, um, <clears throat> especially if there's some, if any, of the, if we're if we're getting involved in sort of more sit down after learning sessions where the pupils are just doing something outside, they're either recording something, and um, comfort is going to be an important thing. Andy was talking about clothing; that's one element of it, but also as in general, as in, and this goes for ourselves as well. Uh, if we are doing things outside and we're sitting down on the ground, that can be quite cold, damp, wet. So having things like, um, as in, you saw in the previous order, we had the crates for sitting on, but obviously, you know, as in if we were having another group using those crates, they would need to be cleaned and wiped down. But having people's having either what's a sit mat, which is a little piece of foam, um, or a, a waterproof cushion that they could be using to sit out that would be personal to them. They could just set that out, have that as their space, and, and that you know you, you can make quick setups outside. Everyone would know where to come back to, and no one would be sharing seats or equipment that might need to be cleaned. 
Um, Spit mats are great, they're really cheap, except they do tend to blow away, is the, is the, is the only issue with them. Um, it's got, we live in Scotland, uh, so it's likely that um, it's going to rain. Um, obviously, the, the first step in taking care of that is by being appropriately redressed, uh, and we would hopefully be encouraging everyone to be appropriately redressed. Um, but it's going to come to a point where, especially if you're doing if, if less physical sessions are happening, that some availability of shelter and shade from the sun, if that if if it's that sunny, um, is going to be quite useful. Um, now these are going to is is probably going to be one of the most complicated things. And um, you can get stuff like that are easy to put up, like uh, gazebos or large tarps and stuff like that. And um, smaller gazebos are quite handy because you can have multiple ones so that you could have them sort of distant from one another and you can join them up and stuff like that. And um, but the they will they all come with other complications like they need to be checked so to make sure they're safe because they're quite sensitive to wind. And um, they'll need to be probably put up every day and stuff like that. If you do have any of the schools looking at um, permanent or semi-permanent structures, they will need to be looking, they will need to be contacting estates and making, basically making sure that those um, those are suitable setups because there's a lot of things to do with placement of that, you know, as in if you place a, you know, a shelter, a semi-permanent shelter that the people can't climb up on that and then climb over the fence and et cetera, or climb up onto the building and stuff like that. Um, so lots of issues around that that will will need to be addressed on a school by school basis. But it's something that will make life, if it's available to have shelter, it will make some it will make a, things a lot more pleasant for both both, both uh, staff and uh, pupils. Um, a lot of the schools just have uh, concrete jungles, so they are blank, empty spaces, and um, and that doesn't mean. Um, you can't do outdoor learning or outdoor learning activities out there. Okay, there's lots of lots of solutions to that. And one of the main ones is you can just bring stuff in. Um, so you can just bring stuff in and um, bring twigs, sticks, branches. And um, so one of the nurseries, Wester Craig Nurseries, um, they actually uh, managed to get uh, they. This is this was the start of last week. So last 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 week, um, they got um, a local tree surgeon who was just chopping down loads of trees. Um, locally to just deliver all the chipped trees um, into their what was a relatively concreted um, outdoor area of the nursery uh, and they, they got loads of branches and they've got logs for sitting on and stuff like that and basically they just dumped it all in the, all in the playground and it's created just such a nice environment for the, the, the nursery pupils to just be exploring and playing with and but I think uh, you know, as in it didn't cost anything, it was free. And um, most tree surgeons um, actually have to pay to get rid of the, the, their wood chips. So if you make friends with a wood, a wood a tree surgeon, they can, um, they, they will just dump stuff uh, at your at your locality um, and the, <laughs> because they're just trying to get rid of it. Um, there's also a website called um, Chip Dump, um, or no, Chip Drop, sorry, I got this wrong the last time, Chip Drop. Um, and you can sign up for random chip drops, but they they, they, do, they do you warn you it's going to be a truckload, and they won't warn you beforehand that they're going to do it. So it's probably not the most suitable all the time. Um, and there's another photo, and then next slide. There you go. Uh, so equipment management. So one of the main things is going to be that we're going to be trying to have to use to minimize the amount of equipment that we use um, when we're doing stuff um, and maximize the use of just um, well, both looking at the outdoor spaces and just using the stuff that's already outside um, and using any outdoor only equipment because usually outdoor only equipment is, is, is designed to be well waterproof so it's easier to wipe down clean down etc anything that's fabric based or stuff like are, are things along the lines and um, that's going to be a lot harder to manage because it's a lot harder to clean and um, so i'm thinking like um, colored jerseys etc colored bibs they, they might not be uh, usable because the the complications of washing them and changing them etc will be will become onerous um, in my experience of going to the hubs um, buckets have been my friend and um, basically i've been using buckets for everything so if, I'm, if I'm giving out any equipment, um, I've been using, I've been placing stuff in a bucket beforehand, putting the bucket out, 
people, if they're taking anything, they take the first thing they touch. Um, and then once they're done with any equipment, what I have is I will generally have a, um, a contaminated bucket. So basically that's a bucket, anything that they're finished with, that it goes into that. If it needs to be used again, it can be washed, or if it doesn't need to be used again anytime soon, we can just leave that for 72 hours, and, and that then that is just um, saves a lot of hassle, basically. Just don't touch that stuff for 72 hours. And um, if you are having to use equipment again, um, a bucket full of soapy water um, is a good thing to have out. You can wash the equipment, let it dry out in the sun, um, and then it'll be ready for use for a later on group. Um, there is a link there as well, um, which is from uh, which is some guidance from Learning from Landscape. And what it is is basically um, it's it's all the guidance that have been published so far on cleaning outdoor equipment and, and how that might manage. So different guidance from England and Scotland and stuff like that. The guidance on cleaning outdoor equipment in Scotland is quite, it's already quite good from the government, but um, lots of way more information into cleaning uh, cleaning, cleaning outdoor equipment than I can uh, could ever manage to to know or want to know. Um, uh, any, oh, no, uh, too, far, too fast, Callum. <laughs> any, um, outdoor learning equipment is going to be quite useful for any outdoor learning sessions that are going to be taking place. Um, clipboards are your friend if you're doing any sort of outdoor learning using paper and stuff like that. Um, one of the things with if we're taking paper and writing materials um, like that, it's going to be they're going to be having to be individual for a child. So another idea for uh, using buckets is actually to have each people have a little like sand pack, sand bucket, so they can carry their writing materials, their chalk, whatever they are using, and that's personal to them, so they're not sharing equipment outside. And um, outdoor writing materials. The, what you can write on is you can get waterproof paper. It's ridiculously expensive, so I wouldn't recommend recommend it on a on a regular basis. It's like 50p a sheet, if not more. Um, options for reusable would be you can laminate blank white paper, and if you use matte, um, if you use matte laminating sheets, you can actually write it on with most things, although it doesn't tend to, once it rubs off, then it doesn't tend to write again as much. Um, but if you're using sort of um, whiteboard markers on that, you can clean those off pretty easily and then reuse them. And um, that can be also great if you're doing any tick off lists and tick off sheets and stuff like that, that you can laminate the sheet and then just um, reuse because you can write on the sheet, and then wipe them off and you still have the text on the original uh, that you were ticking off basically, so it's quite handy. Um, so uh, right, uh, it does make life a lot easier having outdoor writing material, but it, it does tend to be expensive um, is the only problem with it. So um, any, I think next, yes, any questions? So a lot of the stuff about, uh, there's a link there to uh, Learning Through Landscapes um, poster um, that was done with Atkins Engineering um, and about how school grounds could be uh, just more advice and stuff like that about and more better pictures than we could draw on um, how school grounds could be set up for um, outdoor learning and 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 physical distancing um, when when they're reopening. Any questions or feedback so far? Cool. No, I'll move on. Uh, <laughs> so, um, next up, uh, going out of school. Uh, so, now, while I don't expect this to be a, a thing people are immediately thinking about um, once we're going back into recovery, um, it is something that is probably likely, is probably good to plan in now because um, there is much more um, space available outside the school grounds than there is inside the school grounds. And um, so particularly for schools that are struggling for space, thinking about using local green spaces and stuff like that um, is going to be quite useful. I know there's already some other councils within Scotland, they are actually thinking about using, um, they're making or, or making arrangements with other lo local organizations like the RSVB who might be landowners um, and then accessing their lands and using those as sort of extensions of their um, of their school grounds. Um, so that that is something that could, um, could, could be happening. Even at Blair Baddock, there's discussions of um, the local primary sort of taking over some of the grounds in Blair Baddock if we're not busy, um, so that, that 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 space can be used for for um, as the outdoor 
as just more space for the schools to be using, basically. Um, but um, the there is a Scottish framework for safe practice in off-site visits. Um, it's called Going Out There. Uh, and so basically, it's a, a website that was developed um, by Education Scotland and SAPO, which is, again, the Scottish Advisory Panel for Outdoor Education. And it's full of risk assessments and guides on uh, is in how you might set up visit plans, examples of consent forms, and stuff like that. So it's full of really useful information for that. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, Callum, um, unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't um, apply to Glasgow because um, Glasgow does its own thing. Um, or uh, the main difference is that the going out there is set up for um, Evolve, which is a sort of online um, management system of outdoor trips, which Glasgow doesn't use. Um, but all the examples of um, all the all the information on it is quite useful all the risk assessment all the example risk assessments all the example um forms for going out all the example like uh visit plans all the equipment lists it's got loads of information like that, that that's just really useful as an example and um, it's not uh, uh, it's not the exact thing as we'll be doing but it's just loads of really useful examples okay and um, Glasgow's um requirements for um, going outside is that the everything going out of school needs permission from the head teacher, and um, it also needs slide Callum. It also needs um, parental uh, consent. Uh, so that can be done routine expected. So that can be done at the start of the year, and um, so it can be. It could be routine consent for going out to the local park um, or, or going out to the, the, the local green space, et cetera, where, whatever it might be. That can be uh, uh, gotten at the start of the year that uh, someone that um, has routine expected consent. Um, any out of school trip needs a risk assessment. And we're going to talk about risk assessments a little bit later on. And um, Callum's going to uh, go through some stuff. Um, and then it also needs to follow MC48, which is um, the management circular for out, out of school trips and stuff like that. And basically that is set at a one to 10 uh, level. The guidance for MC48 is a one to 10 ratio. Um, so there's going to be people saying, oh, the secondaries don't do that and stuff like that. And ultimately the, the ratio is set by the head teacher. Primaries will generally never go outside one to 10. But some other um, some some other the secondaries might, um, but it, the recommendation is one to ten in MC forty eight. And now, head teachers um, are ultimately responsible for everything as towards offsite visits, and um, that's the big difference between Glasgow and a lot of other um, councils is that head teachers are the ultimate responsibility for approval of all offsite trips. And um, so basically, um, the, 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 it, stop, it stops to the, head, to the head teacher. Everything They are responsible for making any decisions. So they are the ones who have to ensure that everything we just mentioned is, is in place, the ratios, the, the, the risk assessments. That doesn't mean they have to be doing it. And um, it doesn't mean, but they are responsible to ensure that it is in place. Um, we already mentioned about parental consent it can be routine and expected, um, but any civic visits um, to outside um, to, to sort of museums and stuff like that, that can be done on a on a one big form at the start of the year, um, but it has to be specifically mentioned on the consent letter, and then trip information has to be um, so information has to be provided. Um, to the parents and carers on a, a before the, the actual trip. So you might not have detail about the trip at the start of the year, but um, it still needs to be mentioned that they will be going out. Um, we, we don't know what's going to be happening towards a lot of visits for schools and stuff like that as the time goes on, um, especially due with ratios and staff availability and stuff like that. So um, uh, we would hope that people schools are still um, feel free enough to to go out stuff to go out of school once the restrictions are lifted but we'll we'll see how things are going um, so the process you would go through for going through this is basically prior to any off-site visit and um, you would already have consent and approval from the parents as well as buy-in from the parents um, as andy was mentioning earlier and um, as a team you would 
prepare uh, a risk assessment. So there would be a risk assessment uh, for that trip. Uh, and that could be a, a regular, uh, so that could be, um, you could be doing a, reg, uh, a risk assessment for visiting your local park. And that is something you can be using on a regular basis. You'd still, you'd want to be, Callum will talk more about this, but as in a risk assessment for going to that venue, basically, um, rather than just a risk assessment for outdoor learning. You'd want one for outdoor learning within the, within the school grounds, but you'd also want a risk assessment for each venue that you're going out of school to. Um, and then you'd also want to agree uh, agree a visit plan. And uh, I'll visit plans to the next slide. But um, um, and then on the day, leave a note of where you've gone, uh, a list uh, a list of who is out and contact within the schools. So just basically common sense. Uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are well aware of, of going through this process of picking kids out of school. Um, and a visit plan is basically just a written record of the planning process. So basically that. Um, that uh, you've gone through the process of um, going through looking at what needs to be do needs to be done to go out of school and the going out their website has lots of examples of it as visit plans and stuff like that uh, and again the visit plan is something that can be it doesn't have to be done for every visit maybe it does at something and um, at the start of the year and then reviewed every couple of months um, basically so that you can adapt and and, and have it uh, but it is something that all staff who are going out on the visit should be aware of. They should have all been through the risk assessment, the visit plans, and making sure that everything's everything in the visit plan is being fulfilled. Right, and I'm going to be handing over to Callum. But um, any questions so far? I need to find where Callum is. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I've been asked to speak very briefly. We'd be glad to hear um, on risk assessments, and there's just a few key points about them that I was keen to stress. The main one being is that um, people are are often focused so much on the risks and um, they forget about the benefits of being outside and you know the the physical and mental well-being that um, can, that can be achieved. So I'm um, just going to let you read this statement from SAPO, that's the Scottish Advisory Panel of Outdoor Education, which pretty neatly sums up our approach at Blair Barrack to risk assessment. So, um, as most of you will be aware, in the last sort of 10 days, Glasgow um, and the education services have produced a couple of generic risk assessments. So far, they've produced them for uh, primary schools, early years, and ASL. Um, and I'm told that by the end of this week, they should have um, produced and dispersed one for secondary schools and ourselves at Blair Varag, um, which will be interesting to see. Um, but there are other sources that we're going to make available to you. So all of Blair Barrack's risk assessments are going to be available online and all of our standard operating procedures. Now, um, quite a few people um, quite like the, the layout of our risk assessments and they're open to scrutiny every year because we have to get assessed by um, sort of health and safety executive inspectors um, because we're doing adventurous activities with young people. So our risk assessments are have kind of been held up to scrutiny um, quite regularly and seem to be of an adequate standard. Um, it's just an example of one of our ones here. And you can see there in the, the risk rating matrix that's um, you've got the coloured section on it. We try and keep our risk rating um, very simple and clear. Some people use lots of different um, numerical values and then you know a risk number multiplied by a likelihood number and all, all the rest of it and um, we prefer to keep it simpler than that and these are our definitions in the, the Blair Barrack risk assessments and it's worth pointing out that these currently don't match the ones that the council are distributing so for example the, the council ones and um, they've got two different definitions for the word moderate and um, so um, 
it's just worth noting that. Um, for years at Blair Banach, we've tried to use this kind of simple matrix and we've used it to produce various um, COVID specific risk assessments during the, the, the recent period. Um, so there's things like first aid provision, which um, as most of you will know as first aiders, um, they've changed the guidelines for resuscitation at the moment. So um, any of our links that we've got here, it can be a useful template for you um, to use if you want to have a look at. It's just We're just making more information available to you to help do your own risk assessments. Um, there's also going to be some of our standard operating procedures. Um, so some of them are quite generic, um, but as Rudy kind of touched on there, um, it's important that if you're going outside the venue, as you'll appreciate with your, your own disciplines, um, that don't rely totally on a generic risk assessment. You need to know, have a look at the specific venue in case there's any hazards present there, and also the specific activities that you're going to be doing. So the generic ones that Glasgow have produced um, are useful. Hopefully you'll find our ones useful. There's also good information on the Health and Safety Executive website itself. Um, if you just go directly to that, there's templates and things there. Um, it's important that your risk assessments involve all the staff rather than just being told that it's been done. Um, a lot of staff will think of things that have been overlooked. Um, I've mentioned already about the, the need to be specific. So don't just rely on a generic one and think, oh yeah, that's that, it's done, tick, forget about it. Um, you need to make sure that you cover it specifically what you want to do. It's really important, even if all the staff haven't been involved in producing the risk assessment, that they are familiar with the control measures that you want in place. So um, once the risk assessment is complete and it needs to be regularly reviewed, um, and that's quite frequently at the moment um, because all the, the guidelines are changing all of the time, um, but it's really important that your staff know which measures, as well as all the participants, know which measures you want to be maintained. Um, we like to think that um, doing the risk assessments could be a bit of a learning opportunity. Um, I know I've got some colleagues and they sometimes are a bit apprehensive about producing a risk assessment and letting it be scrutinised. Um, but if, we, if we're just open about it, then um, people will learn. And it's well worth sharing ideas because there's often things um, are overlooked and they can be much more robust the more people that are involved and constructive criticism is allowed. Are there any questions about things to do with risk assessments? Okay, the right question about why actually the answer is, is uh, unfortunately is, is risk assessments. So if, if the school has a bike, it must be chosen how you access them, how you clean them, and stuff like that. That, that is what you would have to do a risk assessment for, um, both within the school and within yourself, within your within PFAS, within your own organization. I know we, we plan on using bikes during the summer, so we do have we will have different procedures on how we, how we manage them, but I'm not sure if they're finished yet. Any specific risk assessments? We will be take questions at the end. Any feedback and tell them. No, cool. Uh, we're almost finished. We're just going to be going through um, some introductory stuff as well as some announcements how Blair Baddock is going to be supporting um, outdoor learning um, as we go forward in the school's reopening. Um, so, some introductory, some very simple activities that could be done within the schools um, as an introducing outdoor learning would be about um, just learning about distancing. Um, like you saw there in one of the pictures that the pupils were um, drawing two meter circles, so they were learning what that looked like. It might not be two meters when we um, get round to it, um, but it you know, and they were still getting that uh, impression of what they need to keep away from one another. Um, this could be that they're learning what else is two meters high. They could be learning um, how wh who, who is two meters in their class, or, or maybe what teacher is two meters rather than who is two meters in their class. Um, 
it could be can they jump two meters and um, what's the biggest step they can take all these sort of things where they can um, look at exploring distance in in uh, rather than it being sort of an arbitrary two meters what's what is two meters it's you know it's it's two big paces away that they need to keep away from one another things like that where they're a gaining a better understanding of it um, in the physical world rather than just on the sort of on the cognitive level of, of two meters away from one another also at very introductory sessions would be just going outside and asking the asking the pupils to explore explore their the that their space okay and um, being able to um, just say what materials are natural what materials are man-made um what sort of trees are there how many trees are there and um, just getting them engaged and, and looking at a place that they might be familiar with is just their their playground but looking at it and, and questioning about what's in it uh, and just letting them take the take it take interest in stuff and seeing what interests them and then that could be something a reference for for their sessions that you could base um outdoor learning sessions around or about as a topic if they're expressing interest in a specific thing in in their space outside um, we can also just do simple things, um, just like just going outside and reading outside. So as in learning, practicing or reading, as in that that is something that all, all school children will have to be doing. Um, but as in it's something they can be doing outside without having to be inside in the classroom, without having to be have much more space and stuff like that. And it just can be a nice, pleasant experience. Um, the we are going to be launching um we are we already have technically launched um glasgow school maps and um, so we have produced maps for most of the hubs and we will have uh, an activity guide so there will be orienteering maps we will be producing activity guides that are not 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 necessarily based around or orienteering and um, but based about how we can use those maps for different purposes within the within different subjects so how we can use those maps for looking at spaces and measuring and all these sort of things and um, obviously there'll be some orienteering stuff in there and um, so that's actually on our that's a link to our website the activity guide hasn't been released yet but we release maps of some of the hubs and there will be we will be working on the non-hub schools um, when we can or if we can uh, but if you do want maps for your hub and um, if you tweet us um, and the mapping team will respond to you basically and if you if you do want more maps uh, the best way is just to tweet us and just say our school wants maps or our hub our hub area wants maps and we're more likely to get them to you um, the we're going to there's a currently a 30-day creative challenge going on within the schools um, and come august there's going to be a 30-day outdoor learning challenge or 30 days of learning outdoors as the case may be uh, and so that's going to be we're going to be producing um basically session plans um for it's we're still in planning but it's going to be sort of a mix of session plans for the this is going to be a mix of session plans that people can be doing within the school or possibly some that are suitable for doing at home within with part of the blended learning and um, so it's a, a mix between teacher-led ones and home pupil ones uh, and then it's going to be published for every day for five or for six weeks um, at the start of august so it's sort of as an advisory guide and stuff like that the um the Glasgow Improvement Team is also going to be publishing um, various numeracy and literacy um, resources for to guide teachers on doing outdoor um, learning as well. So they're going to be providing lesson plans and other guides for uh, schools. We are also going to be launching something called Bowls. Uh, this is this is what this is going to launch later today as soon as this video is it up oh, is actually i think the, the recording of this webinar is the only thing that's missing from the launch um, and basically we're going to be providing this is blairmatic outdoor learning services or bowls and um, so we're going to be providing all as callum was saying all our risk um our, our example and examples uh, of all our risk statements and we're also going to be providing support um, to the individual schools um, on a name basis. Um, we're going to be providing copies of this training to all the schools and possibly running more um, alongside the Glasgow Improvement Team. Um, we're going to be 
asking uh, answering questions on clothing because um schools do invest in clothing occasionally and then it tends to never get used because it's not the right type of clothing and stuff like that so it's something that we do on a on a on a well on a yearly basis because we're buying constantly buying new equipment for going outdoors so it's something we're quite um comfortable with giving advice on uh, on that so that schools are buying the right equipment for doing outdoor learning so they're 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 trying to keep their pupils more comfortable and um, the support i was mentioning there the risk assessments is that each um just uh, as as, P as PPAS is set up that we're just we're going to be dividing up all our instructors into um into hubs and um, so that a named instructor is going to be a contact for each um well each area or a couple of areas as we only have 16 full-time instructors uh, but basically they'll be available for the schools or yourselves to contact for advice in outdoor learning and um, so there there's going to be published basically there's going to be clear emails so that basically if you want any further information or you don't know who to ask they'd be they a named instructor from very right would be available to give advice or support with any of the th topics around about outdoor learning that might be going on within glasgow um, and um, yeah we to do i can't remember what the next one um, oh yes, we're going to be deliver, We're also going to be open to deliver um, sessions within Glasgow um, and CBDs for training. Um, these will be done on a cost recovery basis because we still have to fund our service. Um, but we will be going into schools when we're available, um, both delivering sessions and um, delivering CBD, uh, in-person CBD and more online person CBD as, as demand goes. Um, so that could be stuff like doing trainings on running a fire pit or doing further doing further um availability of um doing further availability of uh, well, uh, I, I looked at the chat and got distracted um, so doing tra doing further basically training of uh, orienteering or something like that that you might know a little bit about but you might want to go more in depth and stuff like that or there's also something called the outdoor learning cards there's just other session plans that we could give uh, training on those as well. Um, and yeah, and um, basically, as we already mentioned, we're going to be launching um, the school grounds and um, uh, maps of the school grounds so that they're going to be available for use. Cool. And yeah, so some further outdoor learning resources, and that will be available. So we have a uh, Blair Radic Wakelet that has been is publishing. Um, loads of different uh, outdoor learning activities that can be done. There's also uh, uh, Education Scotland Outdoor Learning and Learning for Sustainability Wakelet, which lists a whole load of websites that are quite handy for looking for resources for learning at, uh, outdoor learning. Um, but the best of those is probably going to be um, the Lost website, which is East Ayrshire's um, uh, outdoor learning um, outdoor learning team and basically they published loads and loads of cbd session plans lesson plans um on their glow blog which is available um and it's all there uh, it's really really good in-depth information they had a project called coach which is a an improvement at, at, at improving attainment through outdoor learning project they run that they, they had that running about two three years ago and they had loads of material produced for that so that's all available on their website um, Craig of Star um, is another website which I linked a little bit that she did have to have a hand an article about hand washing and all that and hand washing stations and how you could build your own. Um, but she's very good at producing loads of information and um, loads of really good articles about outdoor learning and how it can be done and loads of activity ideas as well as she's got quite a few books that are really good. Um, and learning through land is their base their their main um, they're producing information at the moment and their main um, thoughts uh, or their main goals are about improving um, school grounds for um, the outdoor for for outdoor learning and for uh, and just being nicer places and um, so they're, they they do public they run training but they also publish a lot of information on their website on um, stuff along those lines um, if you're looking for more government guidance type things the early years have got way more guidance than anyone else so our early years have got two two guidances published by the um care inspectorate out to play and my world outdoors and they are they're they are early years but they are 
they cover everything. They're relevant for all levels of education, uh, and they really are good guides about everything you would ever need to consider for partaking in um, outdoor learning. And the reason why early years have so much more information is basically they have got lots of funding to do it because of the expansion or because of the expansion of early years and stuff like that. Early years has got lots of money and they are the guidance they're producing and stuff like that is really good. Early years are way ahead of all the other stages of education of doing outdoor learning. They have much more guidance, much more information. They do it on a much more daily basis. And early, most early years will do it every day um, already. Uh, and finally, Beyond Your Boundaries is a uh, guidance published by Scottish National, Scottish National Heritage. Um, and that is a, a guidance for accessing green spaces um, within within your local area. So basically, there's um, there's Green Space Scotland, which is a map of all the local green spaces within Scotland, but also beyond your boundaries is sort of a guidance got in there with it. it. It's lots of information about how you might communicate with a landowner, um, sort of stuff like that. All the stuff you'd need to know, access any green spaces within your area and how, you, how would you go about it. And it has other stuff about risk assessments and stuff like that in it as well. And finally, um, any final questions? Because that's the uh, come to the end of it. Um, so I've got distracted by the chat, so people are popping up stuff in the chat. But any, uh, if you want to unmute yourselves or you want to uh, type any questions in the chat, we'll try and address stuff now. Um, cool. Yeah. So someone's uh, Andrea is saying about a procurement. Yeah. So procurement is going to be a big issue for schools. Um, in that they won't know where to get stuff or they won't be able to get stuff through PPAS. Um, so, um, yeah, so it'll be a big issue with schools not having the right equipment. So, and um, it's good that there's a, being a, a working group set up for that. Someone's asking about a refresher on forest schools. So we don't really have anything to do with forest schools. And um, so forest schools is almost, um, Forest schools is really a concept rather than any, as in a concept of education rather than anything specific. Um, so, for instance, I am going through my forest school training, but it's not something, forest schools isn't really something that's curriculum led, where at the moment the focus is on curriculum led activities, whereas forest schools is more, uh, well, not curriculum led, basically. Um, so it's not really, it's not always applicable for schools. Um, yeah, at the moment, actually, someone's asking about mapping. At the moment, our biggest stop, we can produce maps pretty quickly, or some of our staff members can produce maps a bit quickly. But it's actually checking the maps is our biggest issue. Um, so, because we can't get, we don't have that many instructors who can get around to the schools. And um, so, what we're having to drop back a little bit on our map producing while we're preparing, because we're hoping to open within the next couple of weeks. Um, but if there is, for if people, as in, we can probably look at if people want to, if you really want to map, get a map for your area done, it is possible that if you want to go out and actually, we can produce a map, you can go out and double check it, and we can get the map to you faster than we can do by ourselves, because we just don't have the staff to get out to the maps. Um, oh, no, no, I can't remember you kill. All right. Uh, Any other questions? Rudy, this is Andrew Crawford. Uh, I'm unmuting myself at this point. So, just some of the things that are coming up with regards to the maps. Neil has sent the link um, for the the maps that you're using, and we've sent that to the secondary school to trial it to see if they can access it and download the maps themselves. Um, so if it's successful there, then we'll share that across the team. Um, so that's that's one of the, the issues, uh, hopefully, that we'll overcome um, in terms of getting all the schools done before before August. Um, 
Also, in terms of um, the input for today, when we discussed this with Neil, sorry, I've got a dog. When we discussed this with Neil, um, the idea of the team is absolutely hearing the same message that the challenge leaders are learning and hearing, that the staff are learning and hearing, and they're in that supporting role. But it's good that everybody hears the same message and knows the information that's been shared. Um, so I really thank for for um, pulling all this together uh, and taking the time uh, to do this today. Yeah, no, I, we, it was in we as in we hooked uh, as in with, with everything. I think as in this has forced all of the sort of organisations within Glasgow to sort of work a little bit closer with one another. So hopefully we can be yeah as in again work. We're copying your model of uh, of uh, of being a sort of support for each individual hub. So um, hopefully we're, we'll probably be working with you guys on a more individual basis as as things go on. So you'll have sort of a contact with each individual instructor, um, which will be a, a good link for um, going forward. Cool. And uh, yeah, if uh, no one has anything, so uh, this will be published later on. Um, so, but yeah, as in our, our emails were there, um, we, we will we'll probably get the, the bulls information shared with yourselves as well. So that basically, if you're having any, um, if people are, if, you, if people are asking you questions about outdoor learning that you guys can't answer, um, you can refer them on to us, or refer them on to the instructor responsible for um, the same area as, as you. And that will be um, a, a good way of um, keeping to inf uh, keeping in contact. Cool. Thanks for coming. Um, as yeah.